I did my presentation on Andrew Carnegie, the man who made hundreds of millions of dollars mass producing steel. But he did not get a company handed down to him from his family or anything like that. He worked his way from the bottom, like the very bottom. He was born in 1835 to a poor family in Scotland. And by the age of 12, he migrated to, immigrated to America with his family. And he worked as a bobbin boy in Allegheny, Pennsylvania, six days a week for 12 hours a day for less than a dollar a week. Eventually, he became a telegraph boy by the age of 15. And he soon started working his way up there. He did telegraphs for the railroad. And by the age of 18, he became superintendent of the Pittsburgh branch of the railroad company, which was the biggest one at the time. Now, at his time of the railroad, the Civil War started to pick up. And Carnegie partnered with a few others to start creating steel mills to provide supplies for the people in the Civil War, while also working for the railroad. After the war, he left the railroad company like indefinitely to start his own business called the Keystone Bridge Company, which he based out of Pittsburgh. Now, this bridge company was it wasn't very big to begin with. He just sold supplies to the contacts he had with the railroad he kept up with. But in 1867, the E.F. Bridge was started to be constructed across the Mississippi River, which is going to be a massive improvement because before the bridge, you'd have to go around and get on other bridges, but this was one of the biggest industrial projects of the time. And Carnegie started to supply steel with that. And while he was supplying steel, he also innovated the Besmer process, which is the process of making steel, which was faster and cheaper. So he started mass producing steel. And when the bridge was completed, it blew his industry up. Everybody wanted his product. They wanted the thing that, could, that made this bridge possible, that made this engineering marvel possible. And that's how he made his millions. Everybody just came and got his product. Now, by 1901, Carnegie was 66. He was considering retiring. He made his fortune, and he was ready to be done. J.P. Morgan offered to buy his company, and he sold, or Carnegie sold his company to Morgan for 480 million dollars, which is 13.4 billion today. And Carnegie's share of that was. 225 million, which is 6.3 billion today. And after that, what did Carnegie do with all that money? He didn't go and buy a private island and build a big house and just sit on it. He became a philanthropist. And he started building libraries all over the US, UK, Canada, and even his hometown in Scotland. He built a library. He also built universities like the Carnegie Institute of Technology, which believes in New York. And he did that with, for the rest of his life until he died in 1919 of bronchial pneumonia. Now, this guy sounds like a saint, and, but he was also involved in two of the biggest controversies of the Industrial Revolution. The first one was the Jamestown Flood. Carnegie was a part of the South Fork Fishing and Hunting Club that sat on a hill over Jamestown. And this club owned a dam. And this dam was been owned and resold many of times and poorly maintained over the years. But the club, in their infinite wisdom, lowered it so they could build cottages around it. Now, in the year of 1889, heavy spring rains and melting snow from the previous winter made the dam burst on May 31st killing 2,209 people and leaving even more than that homeless. It was the biggest man-made disaster until 9-11. Carnegie donated a lot of money to this town, built them a brand new library and donated money to help rebuild. The club, however, avoided all lawsuits and everything, explaining that it wasn't their fault that the dam because it was poorly maintained over the years. 
The second controversy he was involved in was the 1892 homestead strike, which took place at his homestead or his plant homestead, Cleveland, Cleveland, Pennsylvania. This happened while he was out of the country on vacation. He left control of the plant to his partner, Henry Frick. And Henry Frick had very strict anti-union views. And when the workers found out that the plant's profits increased 60%, but their pay only increased 30, they got a little mad. So they went on strike. And the plant eventually closed because nobody came to work on June 29th. A wall was erected around the plant to keep the strikers from destroying it, but the strikers surrounded it. So Henry Frick couldn't hire non-union workers because they knew that if they left, he'd just hire people who would just take their jobs, so they surrounded it. Frick then hired a mercenary group called the Pinkertons, who was basically just a bunch of veterans from the Civil War got together because they didn't know what to do with themselves. And these guys were, at the time, more equipped than the U.S. Army. So he hired them, and they took a position across the river from the plant. And on one, one day, a firefight broke out, killing seven workers and three Pinkerton agents. The town was completely shocked that this happened. And the strikers pretty much lost all their support from the townspeople. And the strike soon ended with the workers returning back to their regular pay. But even with these controversies and things attached to Carnegie's name, he's still a huge symbol of the Industrial Revolution. Without him, steel, things we would have today would not be here. Skyscrapers, big cities. Also, he basically symbolizes child labor. He's the 13-year-old in the factory working 12-hour shifts only making a dollar a week, but I firmly believe that without him, that 